right, so good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to another exciting broadcast with us here at Exploring by the Seat of Your Pants. I know we've got a lot of new faces in the crowd today, and so if you are new to us, we are all about bringing conservation, adventure, and science into classrooms around the world. And there's a ton of you today. We have 65 classes registered for this across the continent, so a big welcome in, whether you're in Texas, California, all over Alberta, of course, as befits the theme, Ontario, and more. It's a real pleasure to have you all. Now, as we are diving in with March, we are continuing an epic series in collaboration with the amazing team at Canadian Geographic Education and Heritage Canada to feature stories of Canadian history and exploration. Last week, we got the chance to hang out with Siobhan Darling, chasing mountain lions in the, in the mountains of BC, uh, and Jill Heinerth, who had just gone on some epic dives off the coast of Newfoundland looking for World War II shipwrecks. So it's been a really exciting time. Uh, in just a few days, you've got George Krunas talking about extreme weather, but amidst all of those, and those are some really cool topics. I must admit today is my favorite. And I will announce it in two seconds, but I will also do the housekeeping note that I forgot to note that there is a Kahoot today. So between our talk and Q&A, if you want to play along with a little four question quiz, check out that game pin. I will feature that again and put it on YouTube in a minute. As I was saying, best topic of the Explore Can series, and that is digging up dinosaurs. I think pretty much every child in the world goes through a phase where they want to be a dinosaur a scientist, a paleontologist, and Jordan just never stopped wanting to be that. And so he gets the chance to go do digs in some of the most amazing places on this planet to uncover the stories of ancient life. Now, I don't want to take his thunder any more than this. Uh, Dr. Jordan Mallon from the Canadian Museum of Nature, welcome to the broadcast, man, and thanks so much for joining us. Glad to do it, Jesse. This is what the second or third time I've done one of these for exploring by the seat of your pants. So yeah, and, and they're all on you. I keep coming back. Right away. <laughs> we love having you. If you love coming to us, you come anytime. We'll talk about different stories. There's a lot of things to cover in the dinosaur world, so it's exciting. There are, yeah. I uh, yeah, I can't remember what I talked about last time, but uh, I'm excited to talk about one of the sort of recent projects I've been up to lately. Anyway. Amazing. Well, feel free to dive in. I know you've got a lot to share with us. We can get the presentation on the go and uh, get underway. I will do that. All right. Let me remind myself of how to share my screen here. We all seeing my first slide here? We sure are. Digging up more okay. dinosaurs in Alberta. <laughs> all right. Beauty. Okay. Thanks, Jesse. Um, so just by way, again, of, of quick introduction, my name's uh, Dr. Jordan Mallon, and I'm uh, a paleontologist at the Canadian Museum of Nature here in Ottawa. And um, yeah, I'm going to be speaking about sort of one of the projects I've been working on related to digging up dinosaurs in Alberta. Uh, over the last several years, this project has been going on. Um, this is one I always like showing this video. You know, I talk a lot about doing research in Alberta and uh, I like to show slides of the Badlands where I work. But, um, you know, two dimensional photographs really don't convey just the the amount of depth and the amount of topography and up and down that uh, that there is in the Badlands, uh, you know, certainly compared to this drone footage here. So. This is uh, one of my main field areas where I go to most years uh, on the South Saskatchewan River in Alberta, near um, uh, about an hour north of Medicine Hat, an hour's drive north of Medicine Hat. It's just it's just gorgeous there. And I've been doing field work in that area for, oh, the last, going on 10 years, I think now. In fact, I think this will be my 10th year this year. And, you know, we found a lot of we find a lot of cool stuff out there. Uh, I hopefully you can see my my pointer here. Um, we've got uh, you know we found it in 2017. We collected the the skull of a of a horned dinosaur called Chasmosaurus, uh, which we just recently finished preparing. We find other you know partial skulls of horned dinosaurs. We find uh, in the in the lower middle photo there we've got a photo of. Um, of a duck billed dinosaur footprint. So we do find infield footprints there. We find turtles. Off to the right here is my former student, Tom, who, who was very excited to find a, a tyrannosaur toe claw. So, you know, all kinds of great stuff to find out there. But um, since, oh, 2015 or so, uh, we've, been we've been returning to this site here. Um, there's one of my former research assistants there, Scott, and two of my students. Zoe and Tom, and we're working in uh, a horned dinosaur bone bed. Um, and um, 
this is basically, well, a, a mass graveyard of dead uh, horned dinosaurs, an animal called Centrosaurus. And um, this bone bed has been very, very productive. It has produced a lot of fossils. Um, so we've been going there year after year after year to continue to excavate the site and, uh, and document what we find there. Um, you know, we don't just find horned dinosaur bone beds. We find bone beds of all kinds of different animals in the fossil record. And just to define what a bone bed is, when I use that, that word, again, it, it it's basically means it's a mass graveyard. Um, a, a melange, a mix of, of fossils. Um, this bone bed here is from the Ashfall deposits in uh, Nebraska. We have an animal preserved here called uh, Teleoceros, which is the sort of relative of a modern rhinoceros. And uh, we find their skeletons here by the dozens. And, um, and, and we think what happened here in this case was uh, Basically, we had a, an instant death of, of a herd of these teleoceros about uh, 12 million years or so. And again, the, I mentioned that these were preserved in something called the ashfall beds. They're, they're actually preserved in an ashfall deposit, which is to say that a, a, a volcano nearby erupted and all the ash that fell out of the volcano uh, came down and basically choked out uh, this herd of teleoceros. And one of the nice things about these bone beds, you know, they're, they're sort of sad to think about all these animals dying at once. And yet um, when we find their, their skeletons preserved in the fossil record, we stand to learn a lot about uh, the lives of these animals. So in the case of the Ashfall bone bed, we know that these teleoceros lived in a herd-like structure. We can come to understand, you know, whether or not the babies lived with the adults or maybe the babies lived uh or, or the young uh, individuals anyways lived apart on their own as uh, sometimes happens uh, we also find the bones of other animals mixed into the deposits too so uh, the ashfall uh, deposits also contain evidence of these small and early horses and these small and early camels and turtles that you see here so bone beds are, are a rich source of information that that uh, you know always excites a paleontologist when we when we find them um, I mentioned that we're digging up the Centrosaurus bone bed in Alberta right now, uh, and, and that's a Centrosaurus in the lower left-hand side, so you, you know what they look like. Um, but there are Centrosaurus bone beds are actually known uh, all over the place in Alberta, uh, at, least, at least all over the place in southern Alberta. So I know we have a number of uh, classes tuning in in Alberta right now. Um, Probably the best known uh, area you can go to to look for Centrosaurus bone beds is in Dinosaur Provincial Park on the Red Deer River. Uh, this is where we discovered the first uh, Centrosaurus bone beds in Canada, oh, you know, a hundred years ago now or so, maybe even a little longer than that. But we also find uh, Centrosaurus bone beds uh, in the southern end of the province in uh, places like Many Berries and this Hilda mega bone bed that I have marked on the map, that's the bone bed where I've been working. Again, sort of north of Medicine Hat by about an hour. And uh, you've got some maps here that, that shows just what these bone beds look like when we document all the fossils uh, in place. Uh, we, we tend to map them out so we know how the, how the fossils are distributed throughout the, the deposit. Um, a large number, if not most of the Centrosaurus bone beds that have been dug up in Alberta tend to be found in uh, sandstone deposits. And this is my student, Marissa, standing in one of these beautiful sandstone deposits. You can see all these nice rills running down here. It almost looks like a, almost like a lunar or a Martian surface, um, really fun areas to prospect. And um, these uh, sandstone deposits were laid down, in this case, about 75 million years ago or so, um, along the, the bottoms and along the flanks of river channels. And because we've, we've found so many of these Centrosaurus bone beds in river channels, it was thought that they were formed largely as a result of sort of um, disastrous river crossings on the part of these Centrosaurus. So the idea was 
that these animals would try and cross a river and they would enter the waters and kind of ford the waters trying to get across. And maybe, um, you know, they would bunch up against the, the, the far river bank and maybe the, you know, the, the river banks would be slippery and they would have a hard time getting out. And you would basically have a mass drowning of these herds of, of centrosaurs. And that's beautifully depicted in this uh, painting by Greg Paul. And, you know, we see this today. So here's a picture of some uh, wildebeest uh, in Africa, and they're doing very much the same thing. They're gathered on this uh, near shore here. They're sort of waiting to cross the river uh, at the narrowest point. And often what happens is when they bunch up against that far shore, uh, if, the, if the, the walls of the river are quite steep, they have a hard time getting out, they panic, they crowd one another, they end up trampling each other. And then you get sort of these math death accumulations of, in this case, the wildebeest. And you can, you can easily see um, that this might account, this style of death and preservation would account for the centrosaurus bone beds that we find in Alberta. Uh, the, the bone bed that I'm working in, in, in near Hilda, Alberta, again, about an hour north of Medicine Hat, um, it was actually found by my predecessor at the museum, Juan Langston Jr. back in the 50s. He didn't really realize at the time though, although he found some scattered centrosaurus bones, he didn't realize that he had a whole bone bed of, of Centrosaurus. He thought he might have had, uh, uh, you know, an individual or two that he found, and he just collected a few pieces, and including this nice nose horn, and kind of left it at that. Never came back. It wasn't until the 19, um, it wasn't until the 1990s that the Royal Tyrrell Museum uh, was doing some work in the same area, and they noted that there were many, many, many um, Centrosaurus bone beds. Uh, along the South Saskatchewan River over a stretch of about two kilometers or so. And um, David Eberth, who's a, their sedimentologist at the, at the museum, realized that all of these bone beds roughly occur at the same level in the geology. So when you think about looking at a, a stack of rocks, the bone beds all had occurred, uh, all occurred within the same uh, layer of those rocks. And he thought, well, maybe instead of having many individual bone beds, this all represents one event, right? One mass death assemblage. Um, and by his estimation, that one giant bone bed probably contains somewhere on the order of uh, 10,000 individuals, which is really neat. And um, what's interesting about the Hilda mega bone bed as we've come to call, as we've come to call it, it does not occur in those sandstones that I mentioned earlier. It actually occurs in uh, mudstones, which my uh, student Ergon here is standing on top of this big mudstone unit. You can tell it looks quite a bit different from the sandstones I was showing you earlier. They're much finer particulate matter. And in the case of uh, sandstone or, or, or mudstones, I should say, these are not typically preserved or, or deposited rather in the the beds of ancient river uh, channels, they're actually deposited outside the rivers on what we call the overbank. And so what we think uh, caused at least the death of this herd of Centrosaurus wasn't you know, a, a doomed river crossing per se, but more likely uh, some kind of mass flood. Um, if we went back in time 75 million years ago to Alberta, uh, these dinosaurs were actually living on the edge of an ancient seaway, which bisected North America, cut through North America um, in half, and basically isolated the western half of that landmass from the eastern half. And these dinosaurs were living on the coastline of that western half of North America. And given that there was a shallow seaway there, no doubt... Um, we would have seen sort of monsoonal type uh, storms there in the same way you might see uh, uh, in Bangladesh today, for example. And so um, there would have been uh, occasional massive floods and uh, that no doubt would have uh, caused many mass drownings, uh, at least on occasion. And so this Centrosaurus bone bed in, in Hilda, near Hilda, um, likely resulted uh, from a, a giant um, flood coming off of that ancient seaway that, that drowned this herd. And, um, you know, here's a paleontologist off to the right who's just in the beginning of discovering one of these uh, giant bone beds here. 
Um, it turns out that paleontologist in 2015 was me. <laughs> um, this is uh, what I found um, when I found at least the pocket of the bone bed that we're digging in now. This is what I saw on the surface. So you see this kind of hash of, of bone that's weathering out of the hillside here. You can see this, uh, this punky looking mudstone here and all of this bone hash weathering out. And what we do when we're paleontologists is, you know, we see something like that and we go, ah, there's, you know, there's a source for this bone around here. And we try and follow, we try and find the source by following all this scattered bone up the hillside. And we look for an area in those beds. Um, we look for a source of where that bone appears to be weathering out. And, and that's where we start digging in. And lo and behold, when we started doing this in, uh, this would have been 2016, I guess this photo in the right was taken, we find all these bones. And in fact, we've got some excellent skull bones here of uh, the frill of, uh, of the Centrosaurus. So that's how that particular site was, was discovered. And this is really the normal way in which we go about looking for fossils, really. Uh, so we've been digging it up, as I said, for many years now, and this is a shot of, uh, you know, various museum staff and students who've been out to join me. I just want to make the point here that this is, you know, I get a lot of a credit for the discoveries that are made at the museum, but uh, this has largely been a, a team effort. And uh, every year I have various volunteers and staff and students who come out and help us to develop the bone bed. And uh, one thing we've been doing as we've been digging this thing up is mapping it. So here's a photo of me with a grid square sort of mapping uh, the fossils that we've been discovering in the bone bed so far. And what's really interesting about this site compared to all the other bone beds that I mentioned that we find in Alberta um, is the fact that the bones at this site are they're not all together. They're not, they're not what we would call articulated, although many of them are, but they remain in association. So we can actually, we can actually count uh, the individuals that are preserved at this bone bed. Unlike all the others where the bones are sort of mishmashed, uh, you know, it looks like uh, something maybe a dog might have thrown up. You, they're all just isolated bones and you can't associate one bone with the other. And so it's very difficult to get an idea for, you know, the number of individuals that are preserved at the site. But in this bone bed, you know, here's a skull in red here on the, in the upper right hand corner. And we've got the back of the frill here with these big spikes coming off. That leads up to uh, the, the eye socket here. And in front of the eye socket, we have uh, the upper jaw. In front of that, we have a big nose horn coming off here. You can actually predict which bone you're going to find next based on the, the layout of the skull. That we never see that in any other horn uh, dinosaur bone bed, uh, be it in, in uh, Alberta or anywhere, anywhere else in the world really. So for that reason, uh, as we develop this site, we stand to learn a lot about um, herd structure, for example. Uh, so, you know, um, what, what sizes of animals live together? You know, did the ad adults live with the sub-adults? Did those live with the juveniles? Uh, you know, how many, what's the spatial, you know, how close did these animals uh, stick together while they were traveling around in herds? Questions like these are questions that we've had a hard time answering uh, to date. And I think this particular bone bed near Hilda is going to help us get at those answers. This is just a nice uh, panorama of what it looks like uh, the, the, the view from the bone bed on the Saskatchewan River in Alberta. And you can see here now we're crossing over. There's a, a shot of the bone bed there at sunset. It's a really beautiful area, but it's quite treacherous. Uh, it's, it's hard to get to that site and it's even harder to remove things from that site. And uh, so I've just thrown together some photos here of the ways in which we, we um, remove fossils from the bone bed. Uh, so here's a shot of my student, Tom. Uh, we've strapped uh, one of our field jackets that contains some bones uh, to these planks here. And we often just tend to hoof them out, hike them out, uh, just using uh, pure muscle power. Um, sometimes we use, you know, the strapping for lifting, uh, you know, uh, refrigerators or something like that. And we get a team together and uh, remove uh, bones that way. 
uh, we were lucky enough to uh, find an old uh, hood off of a truck of one of the local um, farmers in the area. He gave us his old truck hood, and we've been strapping uh, bones to that lately and using it as a sort of uh, sled. So you can you can see us here sort of uh, sledding this, this giant fossil jacket uphill. And, uh, you know, it's pretty easy going here. It gets a lot, a lot harder as you get nearer to prairie level where uh, the, the slopes get a lot steeper. But it's been working for us lately. So uh, I'm happy to say, um, you know, we've, we've gotten, we've extracted everything that we've tried to so far. And here we are eventually loading them up on the truck before those fossils go back to the museum. Um, we, and we, you know, although we're still in the early stages of studying this bone bed, what's neat is um, we are finding some new things that we didn't know before. So, for example, here's the skull of one of these Centrosaurus on the left here. And I've got this red arrow here pointing to these spikes at the back of the frill. They sort of curl forward over the frill. Um, there's been some debate among scientists as to whether or not those spikes are just outgrowths of the underlying bone or if they're actually uh, their own type of bone that, that slowly fuse onto the frill. Um, and the problem is, is that uh, we've, never, um, we've never had good evidence for that one way or the other. A lot of the older individuals um, show no signs of bony fusion of these spikes onto the frill. Until now, we actually excavated um, one of these frills uh, several years ago now, and we found that the bony spike here that attaches to the underlying bone is actually separate. And there's, there's an attachment surface on this frill for that spike to attach to. We didn't actually know that's how these animals were put together. So this, this bone bed is kind of revealing some new and interesting information about uh, the growth and the development of these animals, which is kind of neat. There's just the outline of that attachment there. All right, how am I doing for time? According to my watch, I've got a, a couple minutes left, so I'll kind of breeze through the last section here. Um, these are just some photos of sort of camp life. You know, when we're not digging in the bone bed, um, we, we set up camp in various ways. Over the years, we've tended to tent. Uh, and so here's our personal tents. We have a big uh, giant uh, mess tent in the field. Uh, that we often use. Although uh, more recently, um, uh, we've been using this old sort of abandoned farmhouse on the land of uh, one of the landowners on on which I work. And you know, it's uh, it's been a nice place to work. Uh, it's a nice place to um, you know stay in the shade and sit down at the end of the day and enjoy a a cool drink on a hot day after you get back from the badlands. Unfortunately, last year. Uh, there was a, a mouse infestation in that house <laughs> and there were droppings all over the place. And I don't know that we're ever going to get to use it again. And so we were forced to uh, retreat back to our tents. And, you know, uh, with uh, living in tent life, you got to put up with the, the bad weather. But uh, so be it. We, we enjoy it all the same. I just have some nice quick photos here of some gorgeous wildlife that we see while we're in the Badlands. We've got uh, killdeer up here. We see rabbits. We see pronghorn. Uh, and occasionally you flip over a rock and you'll see uh, a scorpion too. So you've got to be careful when you're out there that you don't just go sticking your hands uh, willy-nilly. You might find a scorpion or even a, a rattlesnake. Uh, some beautiful plants out there too. And uh, I just want to end with this. This is um, uh, something we found at the end of the last field season. You can see this kind of wavy shape here. Uh, this is the, we see the same wavy shape on the crest of these horned dinosaurs, these centrosaurs. So we actually have a third skull now in the bone bed that I'm heading back uh, this summer to collect. So we're just starting to make plans for that now. And probably come July, I'll be back out there collecting this third skull. And um, I hear you. Do I hear you chiming in there, Jesse? I was just saying that's spectacular. Like that, just what a cool thing. That's all. <laughs> oh, it is spectacular. Yeah, I'm excited about it. Um, probably more excited than anybody here. So I'm gonna end. On, I'm gonna end on this slide. Um, in the upper left-hand corner here, this is a student uh, who lives uh, out near Hilda. Her name is Summer Straub. That's her uh, off to the far left here. 
Um, she joined me in the, the field this past summer and has been following the work I've been doing out in Alberta. And she was so inspired by the findings in her own backyard that she actually wrote this book here and self-published it earlier this year. It's called Chase the Dinosaur, and uh, it's available on Amazon. And it's, uh, it's a fictional story uh, about Chase here, Chase the Chasmosaurus, but it's based on uh, true finds uh, out, uh, as I say, in her backyard in Alberta. And it's beautifully illustrated in watercolor by uh, Betty Kirshenman here, too, who's a local out that way. So uh, I can recommend this book to you. It's, uh, it's sort of inspiring that this young student, Summer's, I think, 12 years old now, and she published her own book, which is great. And I want to promote that as, as best I can. So uh, on that note, I'll, I'll end it there and I'll... I'll throw to you, Jesse. Well, thank you so, so much for that. What a beautiful story with the book. Uh, again, encourage you kids to check it out. Chase the Dinosaur. We'll make sure you have that name in your inbox at the end of the broadcast, too. Uh, but yeah, as Jordan comes out of this, we're going to enter into a kahoot before we dive in with your questions. I'm so looking forward to hearing from all our classes live on YouTube, wherever you're joining from today. But we'll start with a little four-question quiz. Test your dinosaur understanding more broadly. Have a little fun. And Jordan, what this is, is uh, the faster kids answer, the more points they get. They don't win anything, but they do win our everlasting respect. And you can give little hints for each of these questions as we approach the final few seconds of each one. It gives our students a little extra second here to chime in uh and then i'll come to mr dunn's class in fort saskatchewan when we do our first question so you guys can get ready uh for that in just a minute awesome all right you're pouring in we got over 50 kids way to go i'm going to get this underway and we will dive in i actually have a question for you too jordan when we get started too this, i'm really curious i'm all ears perfect i'll well, start with a group number one all right it's coming up three two one, if you don't have Kahoot, you can just answer in your class. Yell it out. How did most dinosaurs die out? Hmm, viruses, volcanoes. I wanted to keep the alliteration going with Vs, but it just didn't fit. Meteorite impact or mammals outcompeted. We just we just beat up the dinosaurs. Go our tiny furry ancestors. What do we think? Nine, only nine of you. Get those answers in. Four more seconds. We didn't cover this too, too much. Today, but we got uh, the majority of people got this on the dot. No one said mammals. We didn't win. That's too bad. We'll head on. There's a lot of people there who said volcanoes, probably based on something I said, I suspect. We can get back to that question later. We can get back to that. I like that. <laughs> History dub takes our lead over rational horse. I don't think these are the real names. I'm guessing, Jordan. I got a good feeling. The biggest <laughs> animal ever on earth was a dinosaur. True or false? Maybe it's this picture. Ooh. I like adding this one to dinosaur quizzes whenever I, I do. It, do you mean the you mean the planet Earth? Planet Earth. Okay. Okay. Two. Yeah. Forty answers so far. What do we think? Ooh, I think it's gonna be bad. Most of you said true, but it is not true. It is false. Our blue whale is bigger than any dinosaur. So you could actually go out in a boat and see an animal that's bigger than any dinosaur that ever existed. It's kind of mean of me. I'm sorry. In a dinosaur. The largest animal we know of that ever existed is the blue whale, and it's alive today, which is really cool if you think about it. It is. On land, what would it be? I know we find a new big thing every year, Jordan, but is there like a current record holder for like something on land that wasn't in the water? It's yeah, it's one of these big sauropod dinosaurs that you just showed with the long necks. And it's really hard to when we find the really, really big ones, they're never complete. So it's hard to say exactly which one was the biggest. But undoubtedly, you know, there are a few contenders and undoubtedly it was a big giant sauropod. Yes. Every year, everyone who finds one wants there to be the biggest one ever. because you get more Yes, media. you got to give the media a hook, right? You do. <laughs> Speaking of hooks, birds or dinosaurs, true or false? This has been an interesting story because this is one of those, like, when I was a kid, this is just starting to get yeah. into public consciousness. It's true. And I, I think it's, I'm curious to see, I'll be curious to see the results here because I think the, yeah, the public consciousness has largely swayed since like Jurassic Park, you know? Yes. Which is, by the way, so Jurassic Park's a big inspiration for you. Were you around that time? I was, I was uh, 11 years old when I saw it in theaters, and I remember coming home that night and told my mom I want to be a paleontologist. <laughs> yeah. I, I think 
everyone, every paleontologist we've had on to vote your age range. And so that's like a universal story, which is. Yeah, crazy. it's like, uh, yeah, it's probably a lot of astro astronauts wanted to saw Star Wars or something too. Yep. Someone. <laughs> so, okay. If birds are dinosaurs, that means they're still alive today. So how long have dinosaurs been around total? This is our last question. And then we're going to head to Mr. Dunn's class. 500,000 years, 10 million. 230 plus million or 4.54 billion years. One more second. Now I will say, oh, very spread out, very spread out. And no one really had a clear thought here, but it's about 230, 240 million years. Jordan, do you have a? Have there about, yeah, yeah, there about. So, uh, you know, five, 4.5 billion years. That's about how old the earth is, you know. But um, yeah, dinosaurs haven't been around for quite that long. There were many other extinct animals that lived uh, long before the dinosaurs. Such a weird thought, but very, very cool. Dr. Yeti's in third, Mystery Dove second, Rational Horse first. If you are any of these people, let us know who you are in the chat. We'd love to hear from you and give you a little clap. But we're going to head to Fort Saskatchewan, Alberta, fittingly, um, for our first question. Mr. Dunn's group, you guys want to come on in? Hey, welcome to the broadcast. Oh. Hi. Do you have a question for us? Chad, you have a question. Uh, are the, I forgot what the dinosaur's name that you guys were talking about, but is it the most common one in Alberta? Yeah. So I, yeah, the Centrosaurus, I think you're referring to where we find these Centrosaurus bone beds. Is it the most common in Alberta? Probably, yeah. It's, it's certainly one of the most common. Um, there are dozens of skeletons of those things known at this point, partial skulls and skeletons. So, yeah, I would say that's probably one of the most uh, common. Another animal might be something like a Corythosaurus or maybe Edmontosaurus in Alberta. But Centrosaurus is is right up there, yeah. I really like how you did the analogy between them and wildebeest because that's a great way of visualizing it as like these great herds of animals. And we have that with dinosaurs, which is so, it's, I know dinosaur ecology is sort of your field of specialty. And I think it's just so interesting to think about ancient animals and giant these giant unique creatures that are so different from anything on earth today exhibiting the same sort of communal behaviors as things now like it makes yeah. sense but it's also weird it's like cool it's it's yeah it's it's pretty rare you know dinosaurs were their own unique beast there's nothing like them alive today and and so it's it's pretty neat to be able to look back in the fossil record and see these sort of traces of behaviors that that sort of come up and repeat themselves again in, in life today. And yet they, those behaviors sort of originated with the dinosaurs, you know, many millions of years ago. Yeah. Great. Uh, anyway, I'm, this is, the, this is my problem is I get so nerdy out about this and I forget to go to the classes. So I'll head to Glenmore, Kelowna, BC, Ms. Van Oyen's class. Hi guys. Welcome in. Hello. Hi. Have you ever found a Spinosaurus? Have I ever Ooh. found it? You're not the first person asked me that. Um, <laughs> Jurassic Park 3, I think, melded uh, the Spinosaurus with kids' minds. Uh, everyone's aware of what a Spinosaurus is, whereas when I was a kid, nobody ever heard of a Spinosaurus. But have I ever found one? No. Uh, the reason being is I, I've not done field work in, in those areas. We find Spinosaurus in particular in northern Africa, um, uh, and in the Saharan desert. And I've not done any field work, uh, in that part of the world. So I've not found a Spinosaurus, but hopefully one day that would be pretty darn cool. That would be pretty cool. I love the story that like you get this all the time now. It's fantastic. And if kids are interested, our YouTube channel, we've done a lot of programs with Nizar Ibrahim, sort of leading Spinosaurus scientist. So if you want to check out some of the work that he's done, it's on our YouTube channel. Uh, and you can head there after the broadcast, but We've got 10 more minutes with Jordan, so we're going to milk that for everything it's worth. We're going to head to Toronto, Miss Lou's class, grade fours. Unmute your mic, and you're good to go. Oh, I like uh, that shirt. Yeah. My question is, how do you know what color dinosaurs live? How do you know what color they were? Well, how do we know what color they were? This is one of those questions. This gets back to what you were saying earlier, Jesse, about you know things when we were kids that we thought we'd never know. And, you know, when I was a kid, all the books would say, we'll never know what color a dinosaur was. We're actually getting to know the colors of some dinosaurs. By and large, we don't know because color tends not to preserve in the fossil record. So most of the times, you know, if you see a depiction of a dinosaur, it's a guess on the part, part of the artist as to what color it was. Having said that, um, 
I'm sure a lot of kids here are aware that we're finding a lot of well-preserved dinosaurs in China in the last 20 and 30 years. And in some cases, those feathered dinosaurs are so well-preserved that if you look at their feathers under the microscope, you can see these little structures called melanosomes. They're, they're subcellular structures. And we see melanosomes actually in the feathers of birds today. There it is. There's the word. Thank you, Jesse. We see melanosomes in the feathers of birds today. And the shapes of those melanosomes in birds corresponds to their color. So a round one might correspond to, you know, a red color and a long kind of cylindrical one might correspond to a black color or something like that. And we can see those shapes of those melanosomes in the fossils and we can use that knowledge to reconstruct the colors of, of some of these feathered dinosaurs anyways, which is mind boggling. We never would have guessed, you know, when I was a kid that we could ever do something like that. And, and here we are, new knowledge and uh, a whole new world is sort of opened up to us. I remember the first time I read the article when they discovered that and their reasons for explaining it, because it, it sounds like one of those things like, oh, we found the color. It's like, sure, sure. And then you read the science behind it, and you're like, oh, you're just jaws on the floor. Like, it's so, it's such cool science. Yeah. Uh, what a spectacular find. Um, I'm going to head back to Mr. Dunn's class in a minute. By the way, Caleb, way to go for being number one in our Kahoot today and for Saskatchewan. That's awesome, man. Uh, but I'll take a couple from our YouTube friends. So Miss Pearson's class joining us at St. Patrick's School in Calgary. They wanted StreamYard to work, but it just didn't want to work today. So they're on YouTube. And they have a few questions for you, Jordan. So sure. uh, when did you become interested in dinosaurs? Do you have a favorite? And what's the first fossil you ever found? Oh, boy. Okay. When did I become interested in dinosaurs? I think I was like most most kids, you know, I was interested in dinosaurs from a very, very early age. I don't think there was ever a point at which I I wasn't interested in dinosaurs. And so um, growing up, I just never outgrew dinosaurs the way most adults seem to do. I, I just they they remain fascinating to me. And there are little points along the way. Maybe this gets into the next question where, you know, something would happen in my life that would kind of steer me back to wanting to be a paleontologist, like seeing Jurassic Park, like I said. Or when I was a kid, I remember finding uh, my first fossil, which was a small little crinoid ring. You know, it's actually much smaller than that, about the size of a Cheerio. And uh, it's uh, a crinoid is uh, uh, an ancient uh, sea animal. Today, they, they're still around. They're called sea pens. We call them today. But they lived hundreds of millions of years ago. And uh, I found them growing up uh, in the Ottawa area as a kid. And I thought that was so cool. So that was my first fossil that I found. And then uh, the next question, my favorite dinosaur. Um, probably something like uh, a Chasmosaurus. Uh, so that's, uh, I, I showed one of their skulls earlier, uh, one of these uh, horned dinosaurs. Uh, I worked on them as, a, as an undergraduate student in university, and I got to love them. But um, I'm grabbing something. This is a dinosaur I got to name back in 2016. I'm trying to show. Oh, that's perfect. This is an animal called Spiclipius, and I was lucky enough to name this, this dinosaur. This is a reconstruction of its skull here. I was lucky enough to name it, so... Um, it's kind of a favorite of mine for that reason, too. <laughs> oh, I bet. What a cool story. By the way, uh, crinoids. I, I've seen crinoids in Ontario. I grew up in Toronto. So a lot of our students, you won't find a dinosaur fossil necessarily everywhere you go, except for maybe our Alberta classes. But uh, all across Canada, there's fossils to find if you know where to look. So find someone, talk to librarians, might help you find out resources like that. Uh, a great way to get excited about uh, your distant uh ancient wildlife. Um, I'm going to head to Miss Evans' class joining us in Union in Oregon. They want to know, what type of classes did you take to become a paleontologist? Like, what's the, if we want to become career paleontologists, what do we do? Yeah, um, you really don't need to start sort of directing yourself uh, to paleontology until you get to about high school. And by the time you reach high school, um, usually you'll be given a choice if you want to focus more on the arts or fo focus more on the sciences. So I started taking lots of, you know, biology classes in high school and things like uh, geography and geology and, and um, you know, physics and chemistry. And then by the time you reach university is really the time at which you need to decide, I want to do a program in some kind of specialty. Uh, I was lucky enough, I did my undergraduate degree uh, at Carleton University here in Ottawa. And it just so happened that the year I was going into the university, 
they had a new paleontology program and I was hey. to enroll there with one of my buddies, uh, Nick Campione. So we were the first in the cohort and the first out of, uh, out of that program too. And, um, yeah, so, so university is really where you want to buckle down, go to university. And if you want to study dinosaurs, ultimately you'll want to earn a higher degree, like a master's or a PhD. I'm really glad you mentioned too that there are other careers in dinosaur biology though. You can be a technician, you can draw, like you don't need to be a pure paleontologist to do that. Uh, but it is a spectacular gig. I mean, you get to work with people all over the world. You get to go to places, you get to be paid to go on expeditions, you get to find these species, name new species. I mean, that's a really, it's one of the great gigs in the history of the world. So for kids that are keen, that is a, a great approach. Um, live classes, I'm coming back to you in one quick second. I'm going to take one more from YouTube, and I will also recommend, I think he does have children's books as well for our younger classes, for older kids. Rise and Fall of the Dinosaurs is one of the best books in years from a paleontologist, so I can link that to you in the chat as well if you're keen to keep the learning going when this is done. Uh, Ms. Jack's class wants to know, what's the rarest thing you found in Alberta? Is there like a one-off or something really? Oh, the rarest thing. Um, good question. Um, a number of years ago, one of my first years of running my own program in Alberta, we found some parts of the skull of a baby tyrannosaur. And um, it's from a species of tyrannosaur called Displetosaurus. And um, we didn't actually know what it was when we collected it. Um, we knew it was tyrannosaur part of the skull, but uh, we didn't recognize it for what it was. There was actually a student in in uh, Calgary, Jared Voris, who went back and looked at that material. He was studying sort of tyrannosaur growth and recognized it for what it was. And so um, it turns out to be something extremely rare. And in fact, the, the, the first juvenile Displetosaurus that was ever found. So that's probably the rarest thing I've I've been lucky enough to find. That is pretty cool. Well, um, time flies and you're having fun. We're at the 42 minute mark. So I will just go one by one through our classes, rapid fire rounds. I would love to get a second one from each of you. Mr. Dunn's class, you guys are first. If you have any questions while you're having lunch, do you have any questions about dinosaurs or just keen to, to watch? <laughs> I, fossil. Oh, what? I missed that question. Can you ask it again? Do you have a question? Yeah. What, ask your question to the mic. Um, how can I get a fossil? Ooh. How can you get a fossil? <laughs> the best way to, the be best way to get a fossil is to go find one yourself. So you're going to need to uh, to go prospecting, right? Um, and it's important that when you go prospecting, you know the laws of the land. So in most places, you can't just go collecting fossils and keep them for yourselves. Certainly within Canada, there are, are fairly strict fossil laws. The fossils uh, belong to the province. So anything I collect uh, here um, and research here in Ottawa ultimately goes back to Alberta because the province owns those fossils. I can do re research on them and study them and put them on display here in Ottawa, but ultimately the fossils that I find in Alberta go back to Alberta. So if you're going to look for your own fossils, just be aware of what you're doing and what you're getting yourself into with the law. And if you become the premier, then the fossils are kind of technically yours. So that could be your life goal now, if you want to own the fossils, I suppose. Technically, <laughs> technically they're the queen, or well, the kings, actually. Technically, the king. they're... Okay, go talk to yeah. Charles, and we'll, we'll figure it out. That's hilarious. <laughs> um, Ms. Van Oyen's class, come on in, and Ms. Lou will wrap up with you guys in a second. Hey, Glenn. Um, uh, what was your biggest ever mass grave of dinosaurs you guys mm. have ever found? Mm. So, so that's the, that's the Centrosaurus bone bed that I'm working in now. So we found basically a pocket of a much larger bone bed system. So, you know, the area where we're working in, once we fully develop it, it'll probably be, oh, I don't know, 10 by 10 meters, something on that order. And yet you'll remember that I said the bone beds that we find in the Hilda area are found at multiple locations, and yet they all occur at the same horizon within the rock. So they all represent one single event. And that entire bone bed system in Alberta, I think it's been estimated to cover 2.4 square kilometers. Um, and actually, that's the biggest horned dinosaur bone bed in the, in the entire world. So 
you know, we're talking about thousands and maybe even tens of thousands of individuals yeah. that died on mass. So that's about as big as it gets. Yeah, I would say so. Good yeah. question, guys. All right, Ms. Lewis Glass, Toronto, we're going to wrap up with you. I will note again, Explore Canada. If you want to check out George Crudis' presentation, it's next week. We've had all the recordings of all our other talks since November there as well. It's been an incredible series of uh, partnered programs uh, and uh, worth checking out when you're done. But Ms. Lou, um, unmute your mic, read for us, and you're good to go. Hi. Um, how long Ooh. I didn't get that at all. Yeah, the mics, the mics really tricky, guys. If you could speak from the other side of the camera or teacher, perhaps, or repeat that yeah. for us. Now well, we're wondering how long does it take for a dinosaur to turn into a fossil? Oh, great question. What a great question. I, I got that. Yep. How long does it take for a dinosaur to turn into a fossil? It's the, the fossilization process is something we're still learning about. Um, but, you know, it's we're talking about on the order of, uh, you know, tens of thousands of years, likely, because if, if you think about it, when a dinosaur dies, first of all, it begins to decay. And what you need to do to preserve that fossil before it gets eaten or eaten away by, you know, bacteria and worms and what have you, you need to bury it. And so uh, you need to and that might take uh, a year or two to bury a fossil, uh, be it through, you know, river action. Rivers are always depositing and moving sediment and shifting sediment. So it might might take a year or two to bury a fossil. And then what you need to do is you need to take that buried fossil and compress it down into the earth, right? It's a long, slow geological process whereby, you know, the, the geological strata, the layers of, of rock build up and build up over hundreds and thousands and millions of years. And um, you need to compress that fossil and basically alter the, the pressure and the heat conditions. You know, the lower you go down in the earth, the hotter it gets and, and the more pressure there is. And that changes the chemistry of the environment uh, in which the fossil is situated. So that process can take, you know, hundreds of thousands or, or even millions of years. And, you know, we, we've got what we call sub fossils from the ice age. So they're about, t uh, you know, 10,000 years old and they still contain organic material. You can still find DNA in some of that stuff. Um, so it's not completely fossilized, and yet they're 10,000 years old. So, you know, it, it takes a long time to create a fossil, and it's hard to put a precise number on it. There are so many variables, but hundreds of thousands to millions of years, I think, is a, a, is a fair number. I always love when we get this question. I find the fossilization process so fascinating. So thank you so much, Ms. Lou Student, for that. Um, Jordan, this has been so much fun. I really encourage all our classes to check out more of your work on the uh, Museum of Nature website, learning about some of the details of stuff you do. You're on social media as well. You can check that out there. And if you want to watch this program again, head to our YouTube channel to tune in. Um, Jordan, what we do to wrap up every broadcast, you know this because you've done some of this before. I'm going to head to Mr. Dunn's class, Ms. Lou's class. If you want to undo your mics, join me in saying a big thank you and farewell. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Bye for now, guys. Thank you so much.